I want to begin with a quote from the um, GetWisdom.com site from a question. A um, question about a quote by C.S. Lewis who said, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. And the answer that Creator made a comment on was that, and this is Creator's voice or words, um, we are always present. And here again, the deeper meaning of this quote is not only that we are within you and within your heart, as referenced in the scriptures, but because you are extensions of our consciousness in actuality, you have God around you always, as well as being that you are constituted what you are constituted of personally. The human family is nothing more than our energy launched in a certain configuration to create a series of seemingly separate entities with their own personal makeup, personality, preferences, agendas, and destinies. But this looks more chaotic and more disconnected and disparate than the reality. That is simply because your consciousness is unaware of the deep interconnections among all of you and with us. The unfortunate dilemma is that with the encroachment and corruption from darkness, many have lost their way. Many are asleep, unaware of their heritage and their true purpose. As I went into a bit last time, we have five different levels to our mind. And um, to help you, I printed out a little diagram that I came up with as I was going through this material. So you can see under the mind the different concentric circles and um, boxes. And um, again, I'll review. Um, we have at a very, very basic level a cellular consciousness that is the template for our body. And then we have a deep subconscious, which we are unable to make contact with at all. It, it can't talk to us and we can't talk to it. And this was due to uh, manipulation of our DNA. The next level up is the upper subconscious, which is more or less our handmaiden. It responds to what the conscious mind um, asks for or looks to do. And then of course, consciousness. And then, of course, beyond all of that, um, still a part of us, still very much us, is our higher self. But that is in the realm of the divine, in the realm of spirit. And so the connection that it has to us can be um, very subtle because it's an intuitive link that, again, tries to go through the deep subconscious, but because of that manipulation, that... Um, editing that was done, we don't have full access. So it's a very, uh, very weak voice that we can hear if we pay attention. So those are the five, five main parts as I went through last time. And this time I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what else exists outside of that. If you think of the mind as consciousness, really, um, it's a whole different level of our reality. You know, we're in a body trying to express ourselves from spiritual um, essence, and yet we have to deal with this three-dimensional realm. And to do that, we were created in a very specific fashion, but we were also um, interfered with. So we have multiple and separate levels of the mind, each with its own resident beliefs and expectations accordingly, and all are connected to the body in a way that will produce emotions in reaction to what is being perceived. So the thing about, I had mentioned about the deep subconscious, it still knows what's going on in us. It just can't talk to us about it. And all the other parts are also aware of ourselves. Unfortunately, we are not. Um, so 
having just one level that's conscious to that extent um, can't manage to do everything, nor can it protect the other levels that it's not aware of. And um, the other factor is that the one level of the mind can harbor beliefs that the other levels don't have. So think of each other level as being a, a function that is dedicated to self-preservation. Its purpose here, as you're put into the physical, is to keep you alive. And their thoughts, the thoughts of these other parts of yourself, focus on things that we don't pay as much attention to. So you know that your subconscious is aware of what's going on around you and can often bring you a reminder that you said you were going to do this or this memory comes back at a specific time. It's looking out for you, but it also pays attention to what's going on around you. And so these things are prepped to look for dangers to yourself. And some of those dangers, instincts are automatic reactions to get your hand out of the fire, etc. But a lot of them are happening at a level that um, we don't know about, so we don't understand what they're perceiving. We don't understand um, what the main concerns are of these deeper levels of the subconscious. So they do come up with beliefs about what's good for us, what's, you know, that they're us too, in a sense. And they're trying to preserve us, so they look at what's around them and the deep self being very psychic or intuitive is perceiving much more than we do because it's able to look into the other areas of consciousness so it can have an idea that we are in danger because it recognizes things that it knows from past experiences it has access to the akashic records it has access to um what's called a collective unconscious, which are the thoughts of the majority of humans that are uh, persistent thoughts, thoughts that are repetitive. So it knows kind of what's happening in a sense. It, in fact, if you get into a situation where you walk into a room with strangers, your mind can actually tap into their thought plane, their, their weather system around them which is what's on their mind. And you can actually perceive that, you know, that's favorable or not favorable. So these things are not um, unknown. They just don't have the words and the understanding to express how they're put together in us. <clears throat> and now because some of these beliefs might be different than what we consciously express, there can be a little battle going on internally. And our subconscious can struggle to um let us know that it thinks this way about something and the only thing it has access to is emotions that it can create in fact it's the major producer of emotions in your system so it can actually affect the body and give you this anxiety or this worry or concern about something you can say oh that doesn't feel good um, so those things are happening at a level you're not conscious of but they do come into awareness as emotions and feelings. So it's important to know about this because this effect of us being divided in a sense and not being aware of these parts of ourselves makes it very difficult for us to become an integrated whole and to choose things that are beneficial for our journey in this life and beyond. So. <clears throat> so let's see, those are the five levels. You can see them on the picture. Um, I've put in the intuitive gateway as a diamond shape, which is um, located in the deep subconscious. And that is the remnant of what our connection to the intuitive and divine realm is all about. So right now, that deep self has access, but it can't share that. It can, um, the higher self can talk to the deep self all day long. They can go back and forth, have great conversation, but unfortunately it's lost to us. The higher self can only send these very weak, intuitive messages 
up to the conscious self. Um, but the deep subconscious can use that intuitive gateway to go out to these other areas, like I, I mentioned, the collective unconscious and the Akashic records. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about that area. All of this centers around um, consciousness and the, the intrinsic aspect of consciousness, all that energy, is the ability to have a focus. And the focus of consciousness is an intention. It's a desire to create a specific, specific agenda or to launch an idea. Um, so these, these thoughts are what we do. And that's what consciousness is about. But thoughts are things. They have an energy that persists. And if you repeat a thought, it gets stronger and lasts longer. If you have a thought and you say, ah, I don't think so. I don't really want to dwell on that. Put it away. It, goes, it fades away. So we have a working area of our consciousness called the thought plane, which kind of collects, funnels these thoughts into a certain area for ourselves so that they're readily available. And if we think about them a lot, then they're there for us. And, and um, they can be called to mind. And if we decide that we don't want to think about them, we just let them go and they just fade away. And um, that's kind of how the consciousness works. This it's sort of a short-term repository for the working consciousness. And so whenever we dwell on something over and over, these thoughts are, are there. They're ready for us. Um, and it, it actually will take the thoughts of the upper subconscious and the cellular consciousness as well. So we can refer, in a sense, to them. I mean, we don't know they're thinking them, but they'll be there. They'll have more, they'll have more impact for us. So there's this way station. And then as these thoughts are dwelt upon or um, magnified through thinking about them more and more or, dwell, or trying to get to some answer or trying to uh, draw that information out, it, the thoughts get promoted to the collective unconscious. And this is a consciousness that all humans can tap into. And that's where thoughts are that um, are very common, are, are um, thought about by you know, more than one person maybe, or, or even just very intensively thought about by one person. And um, they are also able to be shared. And if you've heard of the idea of different inventions being thought of simultaneously across the world, that's how that's possible. Someone who's looking for an answer about something, putting those thoughts out there can be attracted to that same thought that someone else had and share that information. It all happens on a subconscious level, but that's how thoughts are uh, organized. So it's kind of a way that uh, the system, nature, spirit funnels thoughts to have an effect, have, to work for us. And uh, eventually, when we become more intuitive beings, we'll have much more to do with that collective unconscious area. Right now, it's not as easy to access unless your intuitive abilities are much stronger. Um, but that, the drawback in the collective unconscious is that it also can take negative thoughts. There's no filter on it. So if someone decides that that thought is something they can't let go of and they keep dwelling on that negative thought, it will also get promoted to that area and other beings will share that. <clears throat> so um, that's one area. And then you also have the Akashic records. Um, see, thoughts are, are unique in a way. They carry a signature of who had them and what the intent of that thought was. And that's what allows karma to track the, the disturbance to the force, you know, the balance that we have in the universe. So each intention, good or bad, is 
recorded by karma so that the balance can be maintained. And this is how it's drawn back to you as the originator of a thought or an intention these things are then your responsibility and if you want to um, heal something that you've done that you don't feel was right you can put that thought out there you can um, you know it's 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 the basis of our effect here on this this plane and, and the rest of the universe but we're just separated in time from the effect of it. So like something, we do something, we have some action, we take some action, and the results of that, if it's something that we do in the physical, they're fairly immediate. But if it's something that we do to someone and they don't know, there's no immediate response. Karma takes that in hand and eventually returns it to the person that originated that so that the balance of what they did can be rebalanced by that person. <clears throat> so these records exist for all of us, for all of our lives, and they're maintained. And they can be healed, but that takes a special, special work. So even when something is done to you that you did not ask for, think of natural forces, events that happen, that still creates an, an, an imbalance in your karma. So even though you were the victim in that sense, something was done to you without your um, intending it yourself, it still has an effect on you. And that also needs healing. So that's trauma that we take in. Um, so that's a little bit about thoughts and beliefs and those other areas outside of ourselves. Um, there's a lot of interaction in consciousness, and a lot of things are shared. So it's not as cut and dried as it sounds, um, but this is how we work. Now, memory also is an element of this. The mind, think of the mind and memory as more functions than actual divisions or, or physical locations. Um, our, that's what, when I said karma records these things, you know, consciousness also records all of the events in our, in our lives. And um, sometimes those are experienced by the body physically, by injury or trauma. And that can cause um, the cellular consciousness to hold that memory, but especially it will hold the emotional effects of that particular incident. Now, other things that are more of the, I would say, the rational memory, the, the facts, those are stored um, more in a different area of the mind, perhaps subconscious, because it does a lot of work with those things, and so it can retrieve those memories for us. Um, but the brain is really just the receiver. And so when they find things respond to their manipulation of the brain, it's like, it's like sticking a screwdriver into your television set and finding out that it doesn't work anymore. You know, <laughs> they can mess around and they can cause things to happen, but it's not the source of the signal. <clears throat> Let's go on. So something that came to me more as I, as I delved into this and why I wanted to, to learn about it, um, you start to get the picture that intuition, which we normally think of as something very rare or, or small, uh, is hard for us to grasp, right? But... Um, from what I've read, it's that on the other side, in the spiritual realm, intuition is the main sense that you have. You don't have a body. You don't have five senses. You have intuition as a force that is much, much stronger than we're thinking of it here. 
you use it all the time and you can go out and access what you need to know and bring that back to you and have this instant knowing of what's involved, you can reach out to other spirits, other beings, other sources, and connect with them. Um, so we're not used to thinking about intuition as a guiding sense, but that's what we left behind when we came here. And when we die, that's what we go back to. The trouble is, while we're here, we've learned to put our thoughts together into words in this physical body and then linearly express them and think them. And that's not a function of intuition. That's a function of what we've learned here, how to communicate. And those meanings and things that we use are very, um, very different than an intuitive experience. Now, intuitive, we know, can be things that are images, things that are sounds. To, I mean, we're using our five senses to grasp an intuition. And we could use a particular sense, if that's what we're accustomed to, to take that intuition and say, OK, I can interpret it this way. But it's still an interpretation. It's like having to figure out what that picture represents, what that word stands for, what that feeling or that that nudge, what that means. It's not, it's not as cut and dried as an intuition, because if you use intuition purely, you can know the whole thing about that in an instant and not have a question. So using that sense, and this is one thing that I found out, when, when you die, you still have this division until you're gone up to the light, shall we call it. You're in the earth plane, you're in the lower astral, and um, you have what you had on earth. You have those thoughts, that orientation that you had on earth, but you don't have the memories the way you did because you no longer have a body to link you to the memories that you were thinking about. So the intuition is one that would be useful there, but we're not used to using it. And so we get there and we don't have any perception. It's just dark because we don't have the senses that we're used to. And yet the only thing we can do is think. So what do we think about? What do we think about before? The same thoughts tend to come up again and again. Now, if we've made an effort here in this life to think a certain way, that's coming with us. And I think that's why this is so important to talk about prayer and how we reach out to God, to spirit, because if we make an effort to do that now, if we have those beliefs already within us, then we go over to the other side, it becomes much easier to ascend and to go into that light. If you have no concept of God, if you are an atheist and you don't believe in God, God's not going to say, oh, wake up, you know, get with it. It's like you made that choice. That's why we're here to learn. You have free will. You get on the other side and you're kind of stuck. It's like you don't think about light. You don't think there's anything else out there. You're always taught that it's the end. So there's nothing going forward. It's from what um, Car Carl the Channeler said when he learned about this, it's like a fully uh, at least two-thirds of those that die aren't bringing that consciousness with them of God, of spirit. And they're in limbo. You've heard of that term. Well, that's where they stay until they're helped. And the only help they can get is from the earth plane because they're still in the earth system. Even though they're dead, they're in the lower astral. That's part of this system. So it's up to those that are thinking of them to offer prayers for them to help them move on. And that's important. <clears throat> So we think that we have this mind, and that's our mind, right? We think that it's all ours. We're having all the thoughts. We're doing all those things. Those beliefs are ours. And yet we're finding out that because there's more to consciousness than we're aware of, 
there are other influences on our mind than that. And briefly, I'll go over, we've talked a little bit about it. So um, we know that we're disconnected from our deep self. And it has an effect on us in terms of all that it can see and all that it can make us feel. Um, so it, it's kind of a starting point, but there are influences there that we're unaware of and it can only tell through, through our emotions. And um, it does a lot of worrying about our past lives and what's coming at us. So it has its own um, things to deal with, but it's not the kind of consciousness that's going to invent a way to deal with those. It's going to just warn you. It's going to try to help you, but it can't make decisions like that. We still are the decision maker in our conscious mind. So that's, that's one area with a couple of different focuses. Um, then there's the higher realms where our higher self resides. And those areas can, and our guardians and angels and God, I mean, those are the beings that have the ability to um, influence us. But because we're given the power here on earth to choose, that will not happen without us asking for it. So again, that's why it's so important. Higher self is also the seat of conscience that tells you when you're doing something wrong, when you feel like that was maybe a bad move. Conscience is not available to everyone because in our growth, if we have chosen to step away from a belief in God for a long enough period of time, we no longer accept that that is a reality. The belief is based on perception, and we choose a belief, it also influences our perception. So by saying that there is no God, then there is no opportunity to even be warned about something like that, because it's not allowed. These are the rules of the other side that God put in place for us to be free and grow and learn here. But some beings don't have that sense of conscience because they've been cut off from their higher selves because of their emphasis on, oh, there's nothing to that. And then we have the outer um, other beings that are corrupted. So if you think that corruption is just a one-time thing, it's not. And then what I mean by corruption is embracing the darkness, going after things that hurt other people or for your own power, your own benefit, using other people, those things also stay with you. And those beings that have done it for many, many, many lifetimes have a really hard time coming back to believing in God because they don't think there's any other way to live. So those beings, those, some of them are physical, like extraterrestrials. Some of them are, of course, human. Some of them are uh, spirits, like I said, in the astral plane. And uh, the main source of problem is the fallen angels. Those that are no longer angels have been kicked out, more or less disconnected from heaven, because they chose a different direction. And as they continued to go in that direction, they got further and further away from God, and, and the earth is still a plane where they can exist. And it's still a plane where they can actually um, get some form of life energy because they're they're cut off from the source of energy they're cut off from god because of their choices so the only energy they have available is other spirits other beings other life and so using their energies to corrupt our thinking to help us to do something that they would enjoy which i would say enjoy it's more like by creating a negative situation or energy around something, they can feed off of that. <clears throat> so these are things we're not really told anything about. But um, if you remember Jesus' healing in the Bible, it was at least six or seven times in all of his miracles that he was dealing with spirits that had to be removed from bodies. They were attached to people. And they were causing health issues, you know, assorted issues with the body. But that is real. That is a sense that we're not told about. And to me, it explains a lot. It explains a lot about 
mass shootings. <laughs> it explains a lot about all of the things that happen in our world that we don't understand why they happen. But if you're listening to a voice that only you can hear and making a choice because you think that's you telling you to do this, you can see how this could be very confusing. And then to get off on that path and find that you're going in a direction that you really didn't intend, but because you started following it, now it's getting harder and harder to turn around. So again, that's why prayer for others is really helpful. <clears throat> And I think I'm going to have to stop there. I think that's as far as I can go today. There's, all, there's so much to talk about. I'm sorry. It's, it's the best that I can do right now. But thank you for listening.